Ready! Fire! Welcome back. So Today we're going to do something a little more fun that we don't get a chance to do very often and that's talk about Civil War artillery. Um, I'm standing next to our cannon that we have here at Enview. This is a 10 pounder Parrot rifle. Um, artillery was known as King of Battle. Um, it played a big part in, in a lot of battles, although not all commanders knew what to do with these pieces. Um, but you would have four to six guns typically in the Confederate Army there would be four guns and a battery in the Union Army typically it was six guns and a battery um, and these all work together um, and would go out uh, a lot of times behind the infantry um, or the infantry would go through them but they could fire a whole lot further um, this particular gun like I said is a 10 pounder Parrot rifle um, you can tell the difference because if you look at the breech end the back end of, of the gun it's got a band wrapped around it so the originals were made out of cast iron but a problem they had when they fired them was the breech the back end would explode and so they came up with this process of wrapping a wrought iron band around the back of it to reinforce it and make it so that, that didn't happen um, a parrot rifle was very common as, um, throughout the war um, and it would be rifled so these um, shells that would be fired out of it would go uh, quite a distance. They say that this gun could be accurate at a mile away and it can shoot a few miles away. Um, other common types of guns, there are other rifles like a three inch ordnance rifle, um, but you also have lots of smooth bores. So smooth bore and rifle, that depends on the inside of the barrel. Uh, the rifles have uh, grooves cut into it that spin the shell out and a smooth bore doesn't. So it's more like a big shotgun. Um, some of the smooth bores that they used were uh, six and 12 pounders. Uh, they had uh, what was called a Napoleon uh, cannon as well. And so there was a lot of those. Those were especially good at short range where they could fire uh, canister, th things that were deadly at close range so that they did a better job than the rifled guns did. So you'd see a, a mixture of guns here in, in your battery, sometimes all the same, sometimes mixed where they could go on different parts of the battlefield. Um, this gun, along with the limber back behind us, would be hooked up together and the two of them would be pulled by horses. So uh, typically on a Confederate uh, battery, a Confederate gun would be pulled a lot of times with four horses. Uh, ideally it's done with six and that's typically what you got with the, the Union artillery. Um, but they had better access to those horses a lot of times. Um, six is better to pull these two together. These two pieces together can weigh around a ton um, along with, with the ammunition. So there's a lot of weight for those horses um, to be pulled with. And each pair of horses has a rider that's responsible for, for moving that, that gun along. And then the uh, cannoneers, the people that work the gun, march alongside, help it when it's, it, when it's stuck. Uh, there was horse artillery as well. Uh, these were guns that were meant to go with the cavalry. And with that, it's a little different. The men rode so that they could get to places quicker. Uh, but most artillery was field artillery where you're walking beside the gun. It takes a little while to get around, but it's pretty effective when you, when you put it into use. All right, so now we're back by the limber and we're gonna talk a little bit about what's inside of here. I mentioned a little bit about some of the different types of ammunition that was fired out of it, but this limber is where that ammunition was kept. 
in addition to another limber and something called a caisson that carried more um, boxes of ammunition that would be further back uh, behind the lines. Um, this particular one for the Parrot rifle would carry 50 rounds of ammunition. So 50 um, bags of powder and 50 uh, shells or you know the different things that they're firing out of it. So we'll open it up here and you'll see up in the the box here for those that work on the limber this is a, a sheet to help them figure out what it is that they're firing and how they need to prepare it. Uh, there were a few different types of ammunition that could be fired. Um, for the longest distance they're going to fire a solid shot. So we typically think of a solid shot being something like this, a cannonball. So we're used to talking about cannonballs and this is one. Um, but this is not fired out of our parrot, uh, which is rifled. So these are fired out of smooth bores. So this is solid, it'll go a very long distance, and it'll hurt something or someone that it hits, but only in that specific location. Um, for a little bit closer range, you start working your way into shell and case shot. And the shell is just an exploding shell. It's got uh, powder inside that explodes the shell into a lot of different pieces. As you get even closer, you have case shot, which is the same thing, but there's a bunch of, of little uh, pieces of metal in it as well that will go flying. Um, each one of those require a fuse, um, and that fuse would be uh, placed on the top here for the smooth bore or the top of the, the piece for the rifled gun. And um, there's different types of fuses. There are paper fuses. Um, but there are also fuses where you cut into the, the metal and expose the powder. The idea is that when the gun's fired, the flame will go around to the front side of it and it will ignite the powder in the front of that fuse, which has been cut to the right distance. And that will burn down until it gets to the middle and explodes the, the whole thing. So this chart here tells you what you need to do for that. As the gunner calls out the range, the people back here know that it's going to take so many seconds to get to that point and they will cut that fuse to that exact point so that they can hit um, and explode where they want it to and they'll also know how many degrees elevation to raise the, or lower that barrel so that they can fire and hit exactly where, the, where they want to. Um, as you get even closer uh, there's something called canister and that's just a tin can full of a, a bunch of metal balls and that will automatically explode. It's like a big shotgun. As soon as that gun goes off, it sends a bunch of metal flying, and that's only for close range. A parrot rifle being rifled, um, it doesn't exactly do what it needs to, so it's not used as much as it is in, in the smooth bores. Now for this particular gun, the parrot, it's gonna fire something like this. Um, and you could see where the, the fuse used to be, um, and the inside there where where the powder would be. Um, those particular guns, because they're rifled, um, they need something to catch that rifling to make it spin. And so this one, um, it's been around for a while, so it's kind of hard to see, but you can kind of see the lead band that's around it. And as the gun fires, it'll push that lead ba band out into the rifling and it will spin this as it comes out and it will go a lot further and it'll be a lot more accurate. Um, so. A little bit a little bit different and why the rifled guns were, were so good because they could get at such a distance and and hit um, targets at a at that distance where the smoothbore guns really couldn't do it um, so as the the people in the limber here and the people on the gun work together they can ideally if they need to load and fire the gun twice a minute going through all these these steps and so there's quite a bit of work quite a bit of teamwork, but as they come together, they can make it happen and cooperate with the infantry and the, the cavalry to really make things happen on the battlefield to, for their side. All right, so there, for a full gun detachment, it takes 10 individuals to run the single gun. So we've got a sergeant in charge of everything, we've got two corporals, and we've got seven privates. So we're gonna go through what all those are right now. So standing at the front right of the gun as you're behind it, looking at it, we have number one. <clears throat> number one 
step at load will step in and has a couple of different jobs one is to sponge the inside of the barrel and that's just to make sure that any sparks or embers that might be left in there are put out and then he's going to take that out and as the round is is placed in he's then going to ram it to the to the back end of it and then he's going to want to get out of there okay number two stands directly across from him And at load, number two is going to step in, just like number one does, but instead he'll face to the back. And he's waiting for number five back there to come running up with the ammunition in the gunner's haversack. And number two is going to take that out. And as the sponging is done, he's going to place that uh, round in there and then step out of there as number one then rams. Standing behind number one is number three. And number three has a very busy time. He's, he's always busy doing something. So at the command load, he's gonna take a quick step in and he's got a little leather glove that's on his left thumb and that is covering a vent hole, a hole in the back end um, where eventually um, the gun will be made to fire. And what he's doing is he's trying to make sure that there's no air that'll travel through the tube as the sponge is going through it. Because what feeds fire? Oxygen. So he's trying to cut that off. So he's doing that while his elbow's up so that the gunner can sight under his arm and, and be making sure that the gun's in place while everything else is happening. Once the gun has been loaded, he's going to step out and then he's going to go back to the trail and the gunner is going to come up and sight the gun and tell him which way he wants that gun moved. And so he'll lift the back end until the gunner tells him to stop and then he's going to step back into his regular position. At ready, number three and number four will step into the back side and they work together to make sure that the gun's ready to fire. So number three has a vent pick that he's going to place in the vent and the ammunition uh, that's the powder bag that's put in there should be a canvas bag and he's making a hole in there to make sure that the flame from the friction primer that Hunter has here, number four, will be able to communicate with that powder bag. So this friction primer has gunpowder paste in it and another chemical that when that wire is pulled, it communicates a flame down into the, the powder bag and that's what makes everything fire. So he's gonna place that friction primer in there and attach a lanyard because if the, once this gun fires, he's going to not want to, neither one of them are gonna to wanna to be behind this gun because it could kick back several feet and run them over. So he's gonna stretch that lanyard out so that he's not behind the wheel. And then he's going to stretch it tight. And in reality, the gunner's gonna call fire. And then number three is gonna step out of the way and number four will fire. But for our purposes to be safe, the two of them communi communicate with each other and number four is gonna nod to number three that he's in position and it's safe to step out. And he's gonna step out. And then the command fire is given and number four will pull the lanyard, which will pull the friction primer and make the gun fire. So further, further back behind. You've already seen number five who's busy running back and forth to the limber. Uh, this is the limber back here that has a box of ammunition. For the type of gun that we have here, this would have five or 50 rounds of ammunition stored in there. Standing directly behind it is number six. Number six has uh, the important job of making sure that the ammunition that's being sent up uh, through number five is correct. Um, he's also setting fuses to make sure that they're, they're correct and going off when they're supposed to. Um, to his left is number seven, and number seven helps number six out, but we'll also take turns with number five moving the ammunition up back and forth, especially as you're getting really busy and firing a lot. It's going to be a, a very hard job running back and forth, and so that will help alleviate that. Standing behind them is number eight, and number eight is our caisson corporal. 
Uh, behind this, there would be another limber with something called a caisson, which has two more chests, so three more chests of ammunition. And his job is to make sure that, that this chest right here is kept full and has what it needs to do. So he's going to communicate with that limber and caisson that are going to be way back behind. Now up here in the middle, we've got our gunner. And our gunner is a corporal and his job is to sight the piece so he has a sight in his hands there that he's gonna place and there's a couple different types but this one is for this particular gun he's gonna be able to put that there and there's an elevating screw under the barrel that he can move the barrel up and down to hit where he needs to and then he also communicates with number three later on to be move the gun side to side so he's sighting that piece um, but all along he's giving commands so he's the one directly responsible for what's going on here and then the sergeant is, is supervising it overall um, two guns together is a section under a lieutenant and then four or six guns would be under a captain as a battery so these are all the the people that will work together they will all know each other's positions so if something happened to one of them um, another one could step in they also know how to do it with less people as well Shell 2000. Fire! 